I just want to take a moment to introduce, uh, to ask you all, if you are here, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. Maybe let us know your role, where you're coming from in time and space. Um, today we have an expert who is here to share with us all of his research on the early learning and the brain. I know that I am super excited about that. Um, I want to see if there's anyone here joining us. I'm super excited to see who is in the audience and who is here. Yay, yay, yay. As you all come in, we are excited. So as you all come in, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Hi, Dr. Susan Stevens from Greenville County Schools. Excited that you are here. Uh, we've got Dawn Builder. She's here and excited about that from Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, my goodness. All these fun people coming from all over the place. They're coming to see you, Dr. Hutton, because we are excited <laughs> about everything that you are about to share with us. So just a few um, housekeeping items before we jump right in. This presentation is being recorded, so I encourage you to just take it all in. You know, I'm always one who's snapping screenshots of my, um, my screen or trying to feverishly take down notes, but I have found that when I know that it's being recorded, I can take everything in and know that I can go back and fast forward and rewind and pause on the parts that I want to, you know, deep dive into. So it is being recorded. You'll receive the recording within about 24 to 48 hours after this event. Um, we if you have questions, please add those questions to the Q&A section. All other comments can be left in the chat. And then of course, please remember that we are all here to learn and grow together. So be respectful with your questions and your comments in the chat. Listen, my name is Terry King Hunt. I am the impact manager here at Just Right Reader. Just Right Reader is a company whose mission is to make reading and learning fun for students and engage them in decodables and before in the learning um, uh, for all of our kids, zero all the way to grades five in all of America's schools. So we are here and we are excited to um, introduce our expert for the afternoon. I'm gonna pull up Dr. Hutton's um, bio and I just wanna take a moment just to introduce him, Dr. John S. Hutton is a, pedi a pediatrician and clinical researcher in the Division of General and Community P Pediatrics, and he is the Director of Reading Literacy Discovery Center. Ooh, it's so exciting. His unique reading background includes almost 20 years at the helm of Blue Manatee Children's Bookstore, which in 2019 was converted into Blue Manatee Literacy Project, a 501c3 nonprofit providing books and reading experiences to underserved ch children. He has published 29 children's books, many with health promoting themes, including screen time reduction which is Baby Unplugged, Dialogic Reading, Reading to Babies, Infant Calming, Safe Sleeping, Breastfeeding, ADHD, and How the Heart Works. We are in for a treat, and I am so excited to introduce you, Dr. Hutton. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Terry, and, and thanks, Tracy, uh, as well, for inviting me and to Just Right Reader. Um, I'm very flattered to be here, very honored um, to work with a, a great organization and for the opportunity to present to um, a, such a diverse group of um, attendees from looks like all over the country. I'm looking in the chat, seeing everything from from Alaska to Florida. Um, I saw a couple in there that were that were closer to where I am. I'm, I'm actually currently in Cincinnati, but I'm in the process of starting a, a new position in Dallas. So I'm going to be actually dual appointment in Cincinnati and Dallas. So anyone from either one of those areas, you know, put their hand up. Um, in, in any case, uh, what we're going to do today, I, I know this this session is, is really focused on early childhood, which is my wheelhouse, um, the area sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, I have three children, uh, uh, daughters, all of them, they're, they're grown now, but now I read to all of them from when they were infants until, you know, they really just kind of kicked me out of the room and said that they, 
that the, the, they were teenagers and it wasn't um, wasn't I couldn't believe it, quite as fun to read with their dad anymore, which made me very sad. But in any case, um, so I'm all about and I was also fortunate enough to be read to as a kid. Um, you know, my parents were both big readers. You know, I like to play outside in the dirt, but, um, you know, at, looking back, I was very fortunate to have you know, parents that took me to the library and, and read to me, even though we didn't have a ton of money. But books were our, our, always a priority in the home and apparently it stuck with me. So what I'm going to do is go through some of our research. This is uh, this is mostly research we've conducted in Cincinnati Children's um, ourselves and really just talk a lot about sort of the landscape of early childhood, specifically about how the brain is wired for reading. A lot of the work that I do involves using MRI to what some have described using very high tech methods to verify the obvious, which is that reading really is important to help build healthy brains and help kids um, uh, learn to read as e e efficiently as possible and also identify you know, where kids may start to struggle and, and the source of some reading difficulties. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about approaches to early screening. How do you identify kids that are that are at risk for falling behind? Because we know the kids that are behind by the time they get to kindergarten um, tend to be more likely to stay behind and it's harder and harder to catch up as they get through school. Um, and then also talk about some approaches to early interventions. You know, how can we inspire and empower families to read most interactively with kids beginning when they're little babies and um, hopefully, you know, to last a lifetime. So in any case, so let's dive in. Uh, a couple disclosures. I, I am the founder of a, it's called Blue Manatee Press, a, a small children's book publisher that's not affiliated with my institutions or Just Right Reader. It was really started to, to um, produce some of the work that I'll, that I'll show you here that's really got a health related theme, approaches to screening, screen time reduction, other things, you know, the kinds of books that a lot of publishers aren't interested in publishing, so we just did it ourselves. Um, and I don't currently take a salary from them, unfortunately, but in any case, um, you know, I really, it's a labor of love. Um, objectives for today's talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about what a lot of you may know about, you know, what is the concept called emergent literacy, that, that reading is not something that just kids are, are an uh, empty box and then they go to school and all of a sudden learn to read something that emerges in their brain throughout their um, throughout their lifetime. Hey, Dr. Hatton, can you hear me really quickly? I can. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, there we go. I was like, I can't see your screens full screen. Now was they're there. Me? You guys missed all my family vacation photos. And <laughs> all those, you know, we got all those you now. things about me. No, in any case. All right. So, so this is now the hard part is over uh, zooming the screen. So all I really said before is my disclosures, but um, objectives here, you know, we're going to go through the construct of emergent literacy, talk about risk factors for reading difficulties. I'm a pediatrician, so we're all about identifying kids early. We talk about how the brain is recycled to learn to read, how we take existing brain networks and repurpose them in this amazing process. Um, we're going to go through some MRI evidence that we've collected in Cincinnati involving preschool age kids talking about the impacts of, of different exposures to reading and screen time on the brain. And then a call to action, you know, getting our hands dirty approaches to screening and intervention and things we can do to help kids. So I'm going to start out by trying to all read this together. You know, this is one of my favorite slogans. Um, just wanted to so that y'all dive in there and, and just take it to heart. You know, this works way better in person because everybody kind of scratches their head. So so clearly what you have here is a bunch of gibberish. And, and the reason I have this is this is what it would feel like if you didn't know how to read and you were looking at a sign or a, or a page. Um, it's a bunch of arbitrary marks on the page that are different angles and different shapes and really doesn't make any sense. You look at this and you're like, that doesn't mean anything. However, what if it changed into this? And here we've got, again, still marks on a page. They're different shapes, different angles. However, because there are certain shapes that we've learned to recognize as letters and that these make sounds and then together make words, this is reading. You know, this isn't, you know, in the magic of our brains, we, we've we've developed the ability to, to look at shapes on a page, turn them into sounds in our mind and, and emerge with meaning. It was a dark and stormy night. And as the bleary eyed academic pined for the mountains, his soul was soothed in, by music and song. I went to college in North Carolina. So I do often pine for the mountains. In any case, so again, this is just really reinforcing the importance of and the magic of learning how to read. So risk factors for reading difficulties, you know, a lot of these are, are ones people think about and a lot of ones people don't necessarily think about. Again, I'm a pediatrician. I'm all about um, identifying kids early and predicting things and preventing things. So first of all, genetics, of course, uh, family history. This is what, what 
people often think of when they think about uh, reading difficulties that they're they're rooted in someone's genes, their family history, and that's true. Uh, dyslexia we know is largely genetic. You know, a lot of kids can grow up with all the um, opportunities and experiences that we can give them, but still struggle. And this is about 40 to 80 percent heritable. There's nine genes we've identified. Just something in the brain makes it harder to wire to learn how to read. And those kids need workarounds um, that through different uh, early interventions and special help at school. Home literacy environment, you know, exposure to books and reading that certainly is involved with reading difficulties, you know, exposure to print. Um, this is most related to difficulties in oral language, vocabulary, syntax, semantics print concepts, you know, how books work and interest in reading. And we know that this contributes a good amount of the of the variance in reading abilities longer term. Poverty is highly negatively correlated. You know, kids that don't have a lot of experiences with books or books in the home tend to struggle in those areas. And then screen time is also a risk factor, not necessarily because screens are inherently toxic, but, but because they tend to displace opportunities to interact with books and reading and readers um, beginning in infancy. Other things that, that people don't often think about are, are different medical conditions. There's a whole bunch of them. We published a paper looking at risks of reading difficulties in kids with all kinds of health conditions, everything from ADHD, with, with which a lot of us may think of, kids that just have a harder time focusing on books and, and reading, and things like asthma, epilepsy, things conditions that, that bring kids into the hospital, make them miss school. Um, and also, you know, are linked to differences in the brain. So it's important to think of all these things together that they add together to frame a child's risk for reading difficulties. And working in early childhood, you may see some of these kids enter preschool, you know, a child that's been in the hospital, a child that has some different health conditions and also um, is growing up in poverty and also has a family history. All these things can add together and it's important to ask these questions early. So common links among these, a little pop quiz again, works better in person, but um, links among all those risk for reading difficulties are differences in home reading routines, differences in basic skills, brain development, attitudes toward reading, and school experiences. And really, again, all these things, what I just showed you, can impact all these different aspects of, um, of what helps a child be ready to read, what we call an eco-biodevelopmental model. So the environment with the biology and genetics. Um, so all these are important. All right, so, so I'm from Cincinnati currently, and I just wanted to frame here that a lot of us you know, in, in attendance are from all over the country. And a lot of you probably recognize this kind of graphic. What it is, is, is this is neighborhoods in Cincinnati and the um, showing really uh, rates of kindergarten readiness that vary by um, neighborhood. And as you can see, you know, massive inequities in Cincinnati, everything from, you know, in more well-off uh, neighborhoods, which are on the left, typically um, about 77% of kids are arriving at school. And this is recent data from 2022 ready to read in kindergarten. However, in kids that are in less affluent neighborhoods on the right, and these are high levels of poverty, um, high recent immigrant families who don't have the same resources, uh, a lot of these kids are arriving uh, not ready for, for uh, to learn to read in kindergarten as as low as 7% um, arriving ready. So big disparities, a lot, a lot of work to do. So a key concept here we're going to talk about is, you know, how can we help kids um, get to kindergarten and on track, uh, ready to read? And, and it, it's framed in, in the sense of a concept called emergent literacy, which is that, that literacy is something that doesn't, again, just develop when kids go to school, that it's really starting um, in infancy or even earlier, um, anchored to the, to the types of experiences a child has in the home. You know, their exp exposure to language or exposure to books and reading and readers. And so these are what we call developmental precursors to reading and writing. And so there are skills which we often think about, um, the, the nuts and bolts of how to read. There's also knowledge, you know, what a child brings to the table when they're, when they're uh, learning how to read, largely their vocabulary, which is framed by, you know, their experiences and the types of words they've heard, the types of experiences they've had that, that help them understand what they're hearing when they're, when they're listening to a book aloud or reading it. And then attitudes towards reading. This is often forgotten. You know, do kids like reading? Have they grown up in a home where reading is valued, where reading is seen as something that's fun rather than something that just helps them get ready to take tests? And I think that's a huge, hugely impactful for whether or not someone reads long term. If they think reading is fun, they're going to keep reading. If they think it's something for school, they're going to stop doing it when they're out of school. So it's important to really work on, you know, building those attitudes towards reading and that love of reading. And all these things are anchored to different parts of the brain that we'll talk about. So what things contribute to emergent literacy by age? This is a graphic from a, from a paper that we put out in 20, 
20. And it really just shows that, that um, the, the different experiences a child has in the home um, impact their approach to reading in different ways. Um, early reading, you know, whether it's prenatal reading to your, to your, um, to your baby in utero, which happens a lot. We've actually asked this question. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, moms will be sitting and reading a book or talking to their baby when they're, when they're pregnant. Um, and then certainly when the baby's an infant, a lot of those reading experiences are, are all about relationships, you know, forming that connection between the caregiver and the child around books, you know, and, and where reading is more of a nurturing experience. Then, as you can see, you know, the, um, the impact of skills takes off in infancy, whether it's vocabulary or, or, pho or phonics or whatever it is, and then longer term attitudes. And as you can see, the different hash marks, you know, a lot of the experiences around books and reading have started to manifest by the time gets, the child gets to preschool and then certainly um, accrue over time. But what a child gets out of books and reading just changes over time. Um, this is the skill trajectory. This is another thing. You know, we, we published this graphic in 2016. It's it's sort of a literacy growth chart, for lack of a better term. And uh, along the bottom is a, a bunch of hash marks that are that represent when kids are supposed to go to the doctor. Again, I'm a pediatrician, so they go at birth and two months, four months, six months. We see them a lot in the first couple of years of life, and then it starts to space out where we eventually start seeing them once a year. But the reason I put this graph together is that you know we start thinking about reading and a child, whether a child's doing well in school too often later, you know, when they're in kindergarten and the parents says they're struggling and we're saying, well, what happened? And this is, this is just showing that a lot of these skills are really starting to manifest very early in life. You know, going back to the oral language at the foundation, you know, when a child learns how to, how to babble and then coo or coo and then babble in words and, and sentences. And then they start learning how books work, print, print concepts, and then they start to scribble and that's emergent writing. And, comprehension, just understanding different aspects of a story, and then and then some of their phonological awareness skills come online around age three, starting with rhyming and, and other things, and then they start learning their alphabet. So all these things stack on top of each other, and any one of these, or very often multiple of these, can be contributors to reading difficulties, a breakdown in any of them. So it's important to really keep an eye on the different skills as they as they build over time and, and figure out, you know, why is it the child's struggling? Um, as you can see, they sort of Cut, cut points here are when we start looking at how a child's doing, you know, when they get to preschool at age three, you know, we say, well, are, are, they, are they reasonably on track in their early skills? But a lot's already been going on for the first three years. So a child can arrive behind in preschool. Uh, they can arrive behind in kindergarten where even more is supposed to have happened. And then in third grades, when kids are supposed to be reading independently, you know, there's, there's again, there's so many skills that should, should be in development, and if they're not, then that's that's a problem because kids really do have a harder time catching up if they're behind at that point. The home literacy environment is sort of a, a constant through all this. You know, a child's experiences with books and reading, such as the the just ride reader books, the decodables. You know, type of book that you can get into the home that can help a child and a parent to interact and work on these skills as early as possible. So, getting into the brain, we did mention we we're going to do that. This is another graphic that I didn't make. It's a, it just shows different, uh, what we call sensitive periods in early brain development. Um, you know, how the different parts of the brain are wiring to learn different skills at different ages. And again, across the bottom, we've got zero to seven, roughly what we saw before. And the different little spaghetti noodles here that in different colors are different types of skills. Um, everything from more basic skills like vision and hearing to more advanced skills like numbers and social skills and language. As you can see here, the point of this graphic is that really the, the most sensitive period, the time when the brain is developing most rapidly is in those first couple years of life, really in the first two years when those, when those different graphs are peaked. So for example, vision and hearing um, peak very early, those basic skills. And if, if a child can't see or can't hear, you know, by the time they're you know, four, they're, it, it's really, really hard for those networks to, to develop because um, you know, that critical period has passed. Um, higher order skills by comparison, such as language, which is in orange, still peak early. A child learns way more words when they're little or learns words way faster when they're little than when they're older, as anyone that's tried to learn a foreign language can attest, but they can learn language throughout their whole life. So it's a, it's a peak early and then a long tail. Um, but this reinforces the idea that the most opportune time to teach kids anything is in those early childhood years. So you, you guys being a much of early childhood specialists and, and uh, preschool educators or, or others are really in the sweet spot to make a big impact on a child's developing brain and developing skills by getting involved as, as early as possible. So good for you on that. 
Uh, fortunately, there are some programs that address books and reading early in those first five years or in the first three years, such as Imagination Library and Reach Out and Read that I work with closely. Reach Out and Read's in pediatric clinics and Imagination Libraries um, mails books to the home. But all these different programs and resources come together and, and really impacting early is so important. So I want to show you that sort of emergent literacy skill diagram again, and then just um, do a quick overlay here. So, so really framing, framing this talk is how do the different skill developments, uh, how does that intersect with brain development? And clearly they're, they're linked. You know, the brain develops um, is sort of what's going on under the hood to support development of those early skills. And again, as you can see, really those first three years, first five years, there's so much going on in terms of skill development and brain development that um, early childhood really is where it's at in terms of making a big impact. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a construct here about how the brain wires for reading. When I got into this, you know, I never expected to be a brain researcher. I came into my fellowship in pediatrics wanting to write children's books and, and uh, talk to parents about reading, but I got I was fortunate to run into some mentors who were expert in this area and and, and did some um, kind of deep dive into brain imaging and and neurobiology. And, and I was really surprised to hear that, like, that there's really not. And I would ask this question in person if we were in person is, is, you know, who out there knows where the reading network is in the brain? You know, like, what is the reading network? Where does it live? And the answer is there really isn't one when kids are born. So when kids are born, there's not a built in network in their brain that knows that's set up for reading. Um, reading is, is, is really too new of an invention. It's only about 6,000 years old. So in evolutionary terms, it's really not an old enough skill to have a built-in brain network to support it. And so as a result, you know, there's no hardwired, hardwired brain network in humans or in animals too. Um, instead, what happens, it's really amazing, is it's a process that's been called neuronal recycling, um, recycling of neurons. Uh, we take these existing networks that are built in, such as for vision, language, and attention, executive function, and those are repurposed. Um, first, they, first of all, they have to be adequately developed. You know, a child has to have adequate language and vision, for example. But then these are sort of integrated through experience, through being read to and practicing reading to form what's called an emergent network. It's sort of a patchwork quilt of these other brain networks that learn to work together to form a functional network that works to learn how to read. Um, but it's it's not out of the box. If a child doesn't learn to read, they don't have the right experiences early on, it's really hard to build that network later for reasons I talked about earlier, just the brain is less plastic, the brain is less responsive to experiences and changes. So it's really hard to teach an adult to read when they're when they're adults, it's easier to teach a child because their brain's just, it's it's very malleable and you can you can build this brain, this network pretty efficiently. However, and this does tend to happen in a, in a predictable sequence in typically developing readers. So for example, we start using books with pictures to help us, you know, with the visual and language to help them learn to work together. And then eventually we don't need the pictures because we've learned to imagine what's going on in stories. And, and again, that's what's been called a process of scaffolding. Uh, reading difficulties can be seen as a recycling problem. You know, something goes wrong where either one of the underlying networks is underdeveloped, such as language, that happens a lot in children in poverty, or there's something about the integration of these networks that doesn't go right. Dyslexia is a great example of that, where the visual and language networks just don't integrate very well together, particularly in terms of phono like phonological skills. And then ADHD, one of the reasons that that's um, linked with reading difficulties is just the attention network doesn't integrate as well with the other networks. So uh, reading difficulty, recycling problem. All right, so where is the reading network? I asked you that earlier. So this is a graphic from a video that, that I, I think we're going to share with you guys. Uh, we, we've done a series of videos looking at how reading develops in the brain and different approaches to early intervention and, and some reading strategies. And this is it's not a raisin. It's not a walnut. This is actually the left hemisphere of the brain. And this is a, a take home message for you. So L stands for left. L stands for language. So language lives on the left side of the brain when it's more efficient. Um, early on when people are learning languages, you use both sides of your brain, but then the brain specializes in it and it really, really focuses in on the left. So does reading because reading is really a form of language. Um, it tends to localize on the left as well. So early on when people are learning to read, they use both sides of their brain to some extent, but then when it gets efficient and fast, it's on the left. So what we have here is um, the left side of this graphic is the front of the brain. The right is the back of the brain. The top and bottom 
again, we're looking at the side of the, the, the brain from the side of the head as though you're looking looking at someone's ear. Um, so the different parts of the, of the reading network are, so in, in orange, this is part of the language network. This is phonological skills. This is where they live, the things like rhyming and, and the sounds of words. Um, the green is areas that are involved with semantic processing, understanding what stories mean, um, things like vocabulary and, and putting concepts together. Um, then there's also visual parts of the brain here in the back. So uh, right in the back of the head is our visual network um, that just helps us see things. And early on, it's just seeing pictures or, or marks on the page. But then there's another part of the visual network, this red part underneath, sort of like underneath the, the visual, like under the back of our head. That's a really amazing part of the brain that learns how to recognize things quickly. Um, and it, it's, it uh, recognizes shapes, faces, places, and objects. And it actually learns to recognize letters and recognizes them really quickly. And it's uh, an area called the visual word form area. So when people learn to read really fast, it's because they've trained this part of their brain, the visual part to recognize words quickly so you don't have to sound them out. And that's sort of the process of when kids get really fast at learning how to read, you'll notice early on, they're sort of looking at it like, like am, I am, you know, they're like sounding out words but then eventually Sam I am, they can just see him and go. Um, so that's that's when that part of the, of the brain gets trained. Um, and then attention up top, the sort of the spotlight of, of what you're looking at, this, these areas in yellow. Um, underlying all this, what links it all together, there are these fiber tracks, they're called white matter tracks. White matter is the wiring in the brain that's covered with this coating called myelin that um, is sort of like the, the rubber coating on a wire that makes it fast. And there's a whole bunch of different tracks. These are three major ones that link the visual and language networks. I show you these because these are all gonna be implicated in different, um, like as kids learn to read, you know, some of the research I'll show you, these these uh, these fiber tracks need to get, get reinforced and build up and get stronger in order for people to learn to read quickly. Kids with different kinds of brain injuries or, or preemies, for example, who have damage to their brain, that can involve some of these tracks. And that's why some of these kids uh, may struggle with reading. All right, so what moves the neuronal needle? What are the things we can do to impact the development of this brain network? You know, what are the things that, that help kids to stay on track? And this is a model that we sort of put together um, looking at um, what's called that home literacy environment, you know, uh, uh, things in the home that can help kids uh, learn how to read. So they, they divide into two main categories. One is quantity of, of things, you know, number of, number of books in the home, how often children are read to, their reading routines. And then quality, that's probably a little bit harder to teach and it's harder to study too. Things like the format of the story, is the child interested? How interactive is the reading? Um, you know, are there lots of questions or, or is it just kind of monotone? And then screen time up top, you know, something that may kind of get in the way. So these are the different boxes we look at, you know, what are the things we can do to, to impact a child's uh, brain development and reading skills based in the home? The way we do this, or the way we have done this, is um, again verifying the obvious using MRI, which is um, you know brain imaging technique. Um, this is just how I do the kind of work that, that I've done. Is we start with relationships that we know are true, which is that reading. Um, there's lots of behavioral evidence based in education for the most part that builds language, executive function skills, literacy skills, relationships. So based on that, we do some studies. So we get a bunch of preschool age children, which is the age that I've worked with. And then we put them in an MRI scanner, and and you know I usually joke that we that we you know lock them in there, but we're actually not allowed to sedate them. Um, this is all voluntary. They come in with their parents. We play games with them. Uh, we've called them the spaceship game or the statue game. They have to lie in the scanner really still for about anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. Pretty hard to do. Um, girls actually do better than boys. Sorry, I'm a boy, so I can say that, but, um, you know, they tend to sit still a little better, but you know, not saying anything. Um, in any case, but we, um, and then when they're in the scanner that you can either just take pictures of their brain themselves, the structure, or you can have them do a task. And we've done a task called story listening, where we'll play different stories in the scanner and then just see how the brain is working, um, during those stories. And then, um, we look at, then we decide what in, what factors we want to look at. Is it home literacy environment, screen time, demographics? And then we see, are those associated with differences in either brain function or brain structure? You know, how the brain lights up or how the brain's wired. And then we link those back ideally with the behavioral evidence. So we're really just like, we're building on the existing evidence by 
by combining that with pictures of the brain or uh, and to get an idea of the mechanisms, you know, how, how things are working, what's going on under the hood. So I want to start out like, again, looking at that home literacy environment graphic I showed you earlier. This is one of the first studies that was ever published looking at how reading uh, impacts brain development in young children. When I first read the guidelines around books and reading, I it, it, it always talks about, you know, reading builds the brain, reading is good for your brain. But I, I was, I said, that's great. I want to read those studies and there weren't any. So this is the first study that I did as a fellow or I led. Um, and it was a simple question. It was like, um, okay, so what, if we, if we ask parents lots of questions about, you know, how many books are in the home? How often do you read to your children? Uh, what types of books? How does that impact um, the function of the brain during that story listening task I showed you in the MRI scanner in a bunch of preschoolers? So what we found was, was kids that have um, more exposure to books and reading. And here, here are the graphics. The first one on the left is a picture I showed you that reading network. The one on the right is an actual brain picture. It sort of summarizes the data on these preschool age kids. And we found that kids with more access to books and reading <clears throat> had stronger activity in a part of their brain. Again, that's on the left hemisphere, language and literacy on the left. And it's in the back. And it's um, that sort of rainbow, or that not rainbow, that, that sort of gold blob is an area of the brain that was more active in kids with more access to books and reading during that story listening task compared to kids with less books and reading. And what that showed us, that's a part of the brain that's, again, in that semantic and phonological area that's related to semantic processing, understanding what's going on in stories, and importantly, visualization, imagination. We were visualizing greater levels of imagination or greater access to that part of the brain in kids that had more, more exposure to books and reading. So this is how, this is the first study to show that reading has this definite quantifiable, quantifiable impact on this part of the brain that supports later reading skills. Got all, was all over the place. Um, CNN called it, you know, this is your brain on books, which I never wanted to say, but you know, it was um, out there, New York Times, others, but it was just Fairly small study, but all, what it really did is just added pictures to what we already know that reading is good for your brain and reading helps kids with imagination and their skills. So that's pretty cool. So then the second question we asked was, okay, so we know that the amount of reading benefits. What about interactive reading? What about families that ask more questions during stories that do more what's called dialogic reading, more dialogue during the story, the kinds of things that great books will promote? And um, what we did here is we brought in a bunch of four-year-olds and we actually videoed them reading with their kids. And then we had the ch kids go in the scanner and then we use that same, same story listening task. And we, we asked, okay, so what are the differences in brain activation during this task for kids whose parents read to them more interactively, ask more questions. And there was a lot of variability in the interactivity. You know, some parents were all over it and they were asking questions and making sounds and, and just really, really fun. And some were more monotone, more, more hesitant. Some didn't want to read at all. Um, and there were really big differences in the quality of reading. And the importance here is that it's something we should really be teaching families um, to help them, you know, demystify some of the things that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to go outside of the story and talk about the pictures and make it fun and weird and, and, and just wonderful rather than just sticking to the script. Because there's a lot of, of myths about that, that if kids ask questions, they're being rude or, or whatever it is. But, but here, so, so again, more, more interactive versus less interactive, what we found was, again, differences in a part of the brain, um, left hemisphere again, but not the same as the one before. And the areas that, that lit up here, up in the front, um, were involved, again, with semantic processing and phonological skills, but, uh, but in a different part of the brain that's, uh, that's related to speech. Um, the ability of children to talk, the ability understanding emotions. So, and this lines up with behavioral evidence where we know that kids who are read with more interactively tend to have better <clears throat> spoken language skills because they have more practice talking, more practice, you know, talking about the story and answering questions. So this showed that kids with more interactive reading at home had stronger activation of part of the brain supporting these expressive language skills and understanding what's going on in the story. So that was pretty cool too. So another part of the picture here that we're checking another box that reading builds the brain in different ways. So what about educational videos? In those same interviews with those different news outlets, you know, we'd talk about reading, how it's important, and then we'd I'd always get the question, what about iPads? What about some of these stories that, I'm, that I can click a button and it reads to my child or some of the educational videos? There's a lot of myths around that. So we did a couple studies here where we looked, um, again, this is a little more complicated type of study where we looked not so much at where the brain is lighting up, but how different brain networks talk to each other. 
during different types of stories. So we looked at audio books, we looked at audio and illustrations, which is more of a classic picture book. We looked at animation um, and we wanted to compare these to see are there differences in how these different parts of the brains talk to each other, visual, language, attention, understanding um, during stories in different formats in preschool age kids, you know, like, so, cause you know, we know that kids are presented with audiobooks. We know that sometimes, you know, they'll watch a fully animated story on their iPad or on TV. And then there's picture books. So what are the differences? Um, and so we brought kids in, we've had them in the scanner. We had them listen to stories by or presented stories by the same author, Robert Munch, who you may or may not have heard of. He's from Canada. He's, his stories tend to be kind of rollicking and funny. Um, he, the, the ones that were read were read in his voice because um, he has them available on his website. So that controlled for differences in speaker. And then we had a fully animated version that was on a, by an adaptation that he did for TV. So what we found here was that during the audio story, the, the integration of the brain networks was, was really a little bit, not quite as strong. And there was some evidence that the language network was straining and, and we thought it was, um, we described it as a pattern. And I'll show you later as maybe a little too cold. Um, so the kids were engaged with the story, they, they enjoyed it, but there was just, just evidence that they were having to work a little bit harder because possibly they were hearing words they didn't understand or, or whatever it was. By contrast, during the animated story, kids were, again, they were interested in it, they watched it, but there was evidence that the most of the activity in the brain was in the visual areas, in, in sort of these parts of the brain that are involved with watching. You know, there was hyper-engagement of visual areas where the language areas weren't really quite as involved, the imagination area wasn't quite as involved, and we thought that might be too hot. Maybe it's going too fast, and, and, and they just have to keep up by just watching the story. And then, as you might guess, if you're saying too hot, too cold, the middle one, during the illustrated picture book, there was evidence the language network and the visual network and the attention networks were all working together in this really nice sort of cooperative pattern. And um, so we call that just right, you know, where just it seemed like that. Um, and again, and, and actually we asked a comprehension question too, and the kids did better on comprehension for the illustrations compared to the other ones. Um, but again, the way the brain was brain network networks were coming together in these components of the reading network, it seemed like the one that was most balanced was the the classic picture book, possibly reinforcing why kids like the picture books at that age. And we called this the Goldilocks effect, you know, that that when kids are presented with the story in one of these formats at this age, it could be that audio just isn't giving them quite enough where they need a little bit of a visual anchor to understand what's going on, a picture. Animation may be going too fast where they're just having to focus so much on what's going on in the story, they're not really processing quite as much and not using their imagination as much. Whereas if they have a picture and then some words and they can really put those together in their brain in this just right way to help understand the story and, and process it. And so that may be why those kinds of books are, are great at that age. So this is just a graphic to show how this looked in our, in our MRI data. These golf balls are different parts of the brain involved with these different networks. Um, so here's the connection between the dorsal attention, which is where focus lives in language during and, um, an animated story compared to the illustrated story. And what we have is about 50% less connections between attention and language during the animated story compared to illustration. So it's like there's so much attention on the visual that there's less attention to language, about 50% less. Um, similarly, during uh, a different attention network that's involved with shifting between different types of things to focus on, uh, images and words and, and pictures, um, there was less in, in animation compared to illustration, there was about 50% less connection between imagery, sort of imagining what's going on and, um, and other components of the story, the uh, watching part. So it seemed like that what these two graphics show in this kind of golf ball-y way is that, is that during an animated story, there's just less need, less either less ability or less need to focus on language and imagination. And there's just so much emphasis on the visual, like fo following what's going on in the, in the, um, in the animation that it probably takes up so much of the capacity in the brain. What about screen time? So again, a lot of these interviews and, and people I've talked to are, are like, reading is great. I love it. And you're reading so much fun, dot, dot, dot. What about, what about iPads? What about TV? That's such an elephant in the room in terms of how kids are growing up. We know kids are getting access to screen time earlier and earlier every year with all these different devices and they follow them around and they carry them and they go in the car and they go to dinner. How's that impact the brain? So again, so 
you know, a lot of the work we've talked about so far is talking about how reading benefits different aspects of brain development, how there are differences in format. We did a, a couple of studies looking not at so much where the brain is lighting up, but what about the wiring in the brain, those fiber tracks that I showed you earlier? How does either reading on one hand or screen time on the other hand impact the wiring in the brain at this preschool age, this really critical time when the brain's growing quickly? So the first study we did, we looked at reading. And one thing we found out was that, again, that, that area, the left hemisphere, that looks like strawberry jelly is actually those fiber tracks. Um, and we found that um, kids that had more, more access to books and reading and greater reading routines had more well-developed fiber tracks supporting language and literacy in that area that's involved with the, the emerging reading network in preschool age compared to kids with less reading. These, importantly, these kids with um, more access to books and reading also had higher skills, higher vocabulary, higher phonological skills, higher literacy skills. This is a pretty big study. This is like over 50 kids. And again, this reinforces, you know, access to quality reading materials early on can really benefit that wiring the brain. By contrast, we did another study with this same age where we looked, we asked parents, you know, how much screen time does the child have? Not just the amount of minutes, but we asked about this composite measure called the screen cue, where we asked everything from, is there a TV in the bedroom to the kids use during meals? Um, does parent and child watch together? And then sort of how much um, how much screen time overall and, and how does it influence the child's life? And we found a different pattern. And sort of here what we found was that um, kids with more screen time compared to less screen time, again, this is blue jelly, which is less well-developed in these same fiber tracks in a more extensive pattern, all really all over the brain in the left hemisphere, also in the right. Um, so more screen time, less well-developed fiber tracks supporting these early language and literacy skills and importantly, also lower skills, so lower vocabulary, lower early literacy skills. Um, and and that, that study went off like an absolute bomb, and it was all over the place a couple of years ago. It was the first, first study to really show that more screen time had a negative impact on measures of early brain development in preschool age. Um, and again, it's, it's really, to me, a, a, a sign that we should be careful about you know, allowing kids to use too much um, screen time and too much media at this young age. Uh, there's also a study we did more recently looking at um, screen time impacting the thickness of the brain, not so much the wires, but how thick the cortex is or the surface where the brain cells live. And there are significant differences. Kids with more screen time tend to have thinner cortex in part of their brain supporting, on the one hand, visual skills, which is probably not a bad thing. It's probably more maturation of these areas, but also thinner cortex in a part of their brain that's, that's in areas that support empathy, um, social skills, connections with others. Um, these are the parts of the brain that should be getting thicker at this age and kids with more screen time, they tend to be a little bit thinner. So, and we know in older kids, more screen time, too much screen time can be related to lower levels of empathy. So this may be a sign early on that there are things going on in the brain, even in preschool age that we should be aware of. All right. So what we've done all together in all this brain stuff, which is probably like drinking from a fire hose a little bit, is show that reading really does help build brains that support this early reading network. In young kids, we know that access to books and frequency and format and interest and interactivity all really matter to, to help shape that early reading network. And we know that screen time, we're not so sure. There may be some negatives that we need to be aware of that might help might get in the way of access to books and reading. So those early years really are so important. So I want to talk very briefly in like the last five minutes or so about different approaches to early intervention. And I'm going to kind of go through these quickly because I always take longer than I think on the brain part. But really in terms of early intervention, what are the types of things that a child needs to help them be on track? And we know that we need access to families. We need to get to families and schools are a great way to do it. So are pediatric clinics. Uh, they, kids need books. They need encouragement for routines. They need guidance and they need some, some approach to screening early to help know if they're on track or not, ideally before they start to get behind in school. Uh, this is me playing in the mud so we get our hands dirty. So as far as approaches to screening, this is something I'm really involved with here is, um, as you all know, you know, being early educators, you know, a lot of times kids show up at preschool with a whole bunch of experiences behind them. And we're not quite sure what, what's been going on that led us to that point. But uh, very often, assuming kids go to preschool, you know, th there's a really large variability in quality. Um, sometimes kids continue to struggle and then they, they get passed along, go on to kindergarten, and then they get their first test and realize they're behind. Um, but it's really important to kind of get a sense of what's going on behind the developmental door. What, what, are, what are kids bringing to the table? Are, are they predisposed to be dyslexia? Is there something going on that's, that they haven't had as much exposure to reading? And so 
currently the approach has been called a wait to fail approach where we sort of kids kind of go along and then they get to kindergarten or third grade and then we realize they failed their tests and then we worry and then we do something about it. And I think we should try to be more proactive and look at, is there an opportunity to screen or, or, or get a signal early on, um, ideally in that preschool to kindergarten range where we can see if kids are on track and then figure out how to help them. Because this really is a time when our interventions are most likely to be effective because of the plasticity in the brain and the shaping of these networks. Approaches to screening. So currently there's two main ones. There's parent report asking parents, you know, how's your child doing? There's also direct screening, but I say, you know, as far as the parent report, the problem with that is imagine if you were, that was your approach to vision screening. You know, my child, yeah, they see really well. Um, that's really not how we do it. We, instead of that, we do direct screening to see, you know, how, how is a child's vision? You know, do they need glasses? And so, so we've been working on an approach to screening that uses the same direct screening approach. And this is a, a that's actually a children's book called The Reading House. Um, we've published a couple of papers on it. It's a it's a 14 page board format children's book um, that has a nine item scripted assessment on top of it. It's been validated in preschool age kids at age three and four. And by interacting with the book with somebody, with, whether it's a teacher or an educator or an early childhood specialist, um, it takes about five to seven minutes. Um, you end up with this score and it gives you whether the child's on track or a little behind or, or ahead. And that can help frame guidance for parents um, about, you know, a lot of parents will think their child's on track and, and they'll say, that was really a wake up call for me and what can I do to help them? Um, and we've, we've had really good success with this in, in clinics and here in Cincinnati preschools, it's gone pretty well. This is actually available through Blue Manatee Press, but um, in any case, um, this is the inside of the book. So it so each spread in the book, it's a stealthy screener where ideally the child doesn't realize they're being screened. They're just interacting with the book just like any other book. The screener isn't the text in the book, it's questions on top of it. So the first spread is involved print knowledge, where are the words on the bookshelf, uh, alphabet knowledge, letter sound knowledge, phonological skills, and vocabulary. And again, the, the, the script, you just read through it, ask the questions. Um, and then the last thing the child does is they write their name on the back of the book, and this is a stealthy way to see if they can write their name, and then they get to keep it, and they take it home, and, and they can read it with their parents just like any other book. Um, so in any case, so it's, a, it's been a, a nice thing for us. So we've, this is some of the evidence that it works. It's been validated. We've actually also done an MRI study where we found that kids that score higher on the reading house have uh, thicker cortex and a part of their brain on that left hemisphere, exactly where we'd want it to be. Um, that's sort of the that visual word form area, the language areas that really support emergent literacy skills. And that's the first MRI study that's really correlated early skills with thickness in the brain. Um, and that was really a vote of confidence in the measure. Um, so real quickly, just approaches to intervention, you know, once, so we know that we can screen to see if there are problems, but how can we encourage parents like to help their child um, be on track? And we do know that whatever's practice is gonna impact wiring the brain, neurons that fire together, wire together, that can be everything positive, like reading, math, or art, it could also be negative, such as watching lots of videos, video games, singing baby shark, God forbid, or, or um, being handed a device to calm down, which can get in the way of some um, self-regulation skills. Um, so more encouraged to practice, the better, such as having quality books at home. Um, language and literacy live on left side of the brain. So that practice is gonna help build those first listening areas by hearing lots of stories and then talking areas by asking the child to interact and answer questions, read pictures, uh, try new songs, do word sounds, other things like that. And that helps build those white matter tracks connecting them. Um, again, more reading, more well-developed, more screen time, less well-developed. Um, so again, a couple of books that we've done. One is how to read with a baby. Um, this addresses a lot of myths around reading with infants, that they're that baby's not interested, they're not ready, they cry, they chew on it, they throw it on the floor. And and I worry that and when encouraging parents to read with infants, if the, if the infant cries or does something, the parent's going to think they're doing it wrong or that they're their, their child doesn't like books or they're not smart. And it's really important to frame expectations around this, that, that reading with infant is messy. It looks much more like this picture on the right. And to do that, we've developed a, a method called SHARE STEP, which is an acronym, um, stands for snuggle, hold, show affection, respond and enjoy, ways to interact with the baby around the book. And then the STEP part is the ways to respond, stretch word sounds, which use parentese, you know, puppy, things like that, talk about books, and pictures, explore word sounds and be patient. 
Um, and we've we've been studied this and and parents seem to like it. It does seem to help frame expectations and this book, share this book, which is available. Blue Manti Press is a training manual in a sense. It's actually a children's book, but it sort of reinforces this approach. We have it in Spanish as well. And it's called Comfort Here. Uh, again, dialogic reading with older kids. Um, you know, a lot of you may have heard of this. Dialogic reading is just a fancy term for interactive, fun reading. I had a parent raise their hand and say that, you know, aren't you just talking about fun reading? And this sort of addresses a lot of those misconceptions around reading, that it's okay for kids to ask questions and talk, and really books should be a catalyst for conversation more than just the book itself. Um, but how do you do it? And it's actually a scientifically studied method that came out in the 80s. It's got an acronym behind it that's not as good as share step. It's called peer crowd. And um, peer, peer stands for prompt, evaluate, expand, and re repeat, I believe. And, um, and then crowd is different ways to um, different prompts, different, it's essentially a way to types of questions you can ask and then how to respond to those questions to, enter, to form an interactive dialogue around the story. And this is a book that I wrote called Cows that forces a, a parent to be, inter, be dialogic through the story. So the first one, it forces them to do a completion prompt um, hey, diddle, blank, and then makes the child say fiddle, and cow jumped over that moon. Uh, the next recall prompts, just asking questions. Did you just see a cow? What was it doing? Open-ended questions. What do cows like to do? And it's, there's no right answer here, just like the child can use their imagination. WH questions have, have a right answer. Um, again, more of those. And then, um, so the WH questions, there's different types and it's important, like if a child answers correctly, you kind of expand on it. You know, what's that? It's a pig. Pigs are pink. They like to play in the mud and that's an expansion. And then distancing, relating it to the child's life. You know, have you been to a farm? You know, what's that like? Um, so stealthy training materials, you know, interacting through the book and just helping, because a lot of parents don't come to the, come with this naturally. It's just, there are some more hesitations. So just making it fun. And we've got dogs, cats and bugs too. Uh, and I just want to draw attention to some of these videos. We're going to share links to them. They're all free. They're on YouTube. They're through Cincinnati Children's uh, website that that describe dialogic reading and share step and and how reading affects the brain and screen time. Um, you're welcome to use those and share them as much as you like. I want to thank everybody for your time. And it's a lot of information. Um, I have my email on here if anyone wants to get in touch with me at either Southwestern in Texas or Cincinnati. And thanks again to Just Right Reader for inviting me. I'll take questions if we have time. So what advice do you have for district leaders in schools that are um, experiencing this understanding how it's supposed to grow and um, how they can start to be a part of this work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think just um, continuing to reinforce the idea that the earlier we get involved with kids and families, the better. And early childhood really is the time when you get the most bang for your buck in terms of, of identifying problems before they start to really take root. Um, interventions are more likely to be effective at that age. And um, and one of the things I like about the brain science is it sort of takes, you know, the idea that reading is a really nice thing to do with kids and everything, and it anchors it back to the brain and says, no, this is actually a really critical, critical way to um, provide experiences to kids that are going to help their brain develop in a healthy way. Um, and it's not just an optional kind of nice thing. It's, it's, it's as critical a nutrient as, as, you know, healthy food and, and, and water and everything. But, but I, and I, and I think that schools, um, I've had a lot of success presenting this to, to legislators, for example, and just reinforcing that investment in early childhood is so important because it anchors back to, to healthy brain development and cognitive development. So as much as you can point at the research, you know, that's going to hopefully help, um, help liberate budgets and, and resources for teachers that are on the front line. Awesome. I do. I, I One of the questions that came up because we saw such a push for, you know, digital learning right now in the schools. And of course, everybody here got, you know, iPads and everything. So um, I know we're talking about screen time and how we want to manage that and monitor that. But is there any research that um, addresses reading books, right? If we're trying to give families access to books, um, is there any research around accessing books digitally versus actually holding them in their hands? I think there, there are some advantages to, and, and there, are, there is a little bit of research for that, that 
one of the one of the issues with digital books is that there tends to be more of a focus on the device. You know, the child gets it and they're kind of they know behind the book is other stuff. You know, mm -hmm. there's buttons and, and other apps and everything. And so like the, the dumber the device, the better in terms of if you just focus on the book, it's it's fine to read it digitally versus a paper book. Um, the key the key element is the, re the reader, you know, having the human reader involved who has the opportunity to ask questions and answer questions and talk about feelings and create that nurturing experience that makes it so much more rich and robust compared to just if the child is sitting with the device, clicking a button and it's, it's sort of giving them words. The other side, side of the digital books is if it's all coming at, at the child through the device and they don't have an opportunity to talk and ask questions, they're not gonna build those expressive skills and those sort of the types of skills that are they're involved with going back and forth with a person. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I love it. This has really been excellent. Um, thank you, Dr. Hutton, so much for your time. Uh, for all of you who have joined us today, thank you for being such a warm and responsive audience. Thank you for um, engaging with us. And I hope you found this time, this webinar valuable and a really good investment of your time in your practice. Um, please be sure to continue to follow us at Just Right Reader. Um, continue to follow us. Uh, we just had a podcast that just launched. So follow us on all of our social media platforms so that you can stay abreast of all of the new and exciting things that are happening with this work as we partner with researchers just like Dr. Hutton to do the best thing for kids all across America. Um, Please be reminded that you will be receiving a recording of this presentation um, in the next few days. And if you have questions regarding Just Right Reader or any of the work that Dr. Hutton is doing, please feel free to reach out. Dr. Hutton, before we jump off, how can they contact you and get in touch with you? So I had my email address at the end of the slides that I, that I shared. Um, and uh, yeah, you can just send me an email is fine. So. Fantastic. All right. Well, until next time, thank you so much for being here and happy reading. Happy reading. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everyone.